Local small businessmen Raymond Martinez and Monita Moser are on trial because of a conspiracy set into motion by high-ranking law enforcement officials. This three-part series begins with former customs official who the former United States attorney freed in exchange for a scheme. His name is Henry Alvindia and he entrapped the couple in a lie that has them on trial for the alleged importation of methamphetamine. Martinez and Moser currently are preparing for their second trial in the District Court of Guam after their first trial by jury produced no verdict. Alvindia is a star witness, but the story starts well before 2015. When Alvindia first contacted Martina and Moser to entrap them in this scheme, Alvindia, whom the government is relying upon to send Martinez and Moser to jail for a crime that this married couple did not commit. Alvindia has been in and out of the justice system since 2002. But unlike most people who run into trouble, his criminal acti activity for nearly two decades was committed as a uniform officer within the justice system itself. Alvindia became, first became a Guam customs officer in 1995. Four years later, he became a federal agent with the U.S. Customs, later Homeland Security. As a federal agent in 2002, Alvindia was using federal, a federal vehicle to engage in an affair with a Guam Police Department employee, who was, the, who was also the wife of a police officer known to Alvindia. On July 25, 2002, Mardell Tamashiro, resident agent in charge of the, of the Office of Investigations, contacted Internal Affairs in San Francisco to report what would become an investigation into Alvindia. Alvindia was questioned, lied, failed the polygraph test, and then admitted the misuse of federal property, which led to the affair continuing to motel rooms because the government car wasn't comfortable enough for him and his mistress. Alvindia was fired from the U.S. Customs Homeland Security and on August 7, 2003, for breaking the law and abusing his authority. A year later, Chief of Guam Customs, Ralph Scandaluri, hired Alvindia back into Guam Customs after knowing of Alvindia's criminal history. The question is, why would Scandaluri rehire Alvindia into a law enforcement agency if Alvindia has a recent criminal history with the federal government? The answer would be placed on the record a decade later by several Guam Customs officers in interviews with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. On April 28, 2011, FBI Special Agent Gerald Hewitt took the sworn testimony of Guam Customs Officer Eugene McDonald, who is quoted as saying that Alvindia are close personal friends. On October 4, 2011, in a recorded conversation between former Guam Customs Officer Frank Cruz and an FBI informant, Cruz tells the informant several times that Scambaluri and Alvindia are close friends and that Alvindia, quote, does Scambaluri's bidding. Personal friends. On October 4, 2011, in a recorded conversation between former Guam Customs Officer Frank Cruz and an FBI informant, Cruz tells the informant several times that Scambaluri and Alvindia are close friends and that Alvindia, quote, does Scambaluri's bidding. Who is this informant? What bidding does Alvindia do for Scandaluri and how does this tie into the Martinez and Moser case? Across the Micronesia Mall are three shops owned by local businessmen Ro and Lydia Valencia. Valencia's check cashing service, Valencia's wholesale and retail, and Cabinet fast food. For years, Mr. Valencia had dealt with the spoilage of his shipments because Guam Customs officials left his containers uninspected at the island's ports of entry. He lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in merchandise and business simply because the ineptitude of customs officials. In 2008, Valencia vented about these facts to the, Mar to the Mariana Shipping Line Shipping Department Manager, Ken Constantino, who also worked for CTSI Logistics. Constantino told Mrs. Valencia that it was in her best interest to bribe bomb customs officials with food and drinks from their restaurant in order to get their containers inspected in a timely manner. Shortly after that, Guam customs officials Henry Alvindia, Frank Cruz, Tommy Lynn Pablo, 
glenchrysostomal and hepatitis polyneal devise a scheme that involved not only the timely inspection of the Lynch's container shipments, but also the shipment of cigarettes that would enter Guam undetected and untaxed. Alvindia was the only customs official who carried the customs seal used to certify and stamp inspections, a position of significant authority given to him by Ralph Scandaluri. Former Department of uh, Department of Revenue and Taxation Inspectors Jerry Salas and John Burrito, Alcoholic Beverage, Beverage Control, Control Compliance Officers, also were in the scheme. Both Salas and Burrito frequently attended a number of local bars between 2004 and 2009, taking bribes from bar owners in order for the two to look the other way on a number of compliance issues or to shut down the bars of the competition. But it wasn't just bars where this duo would abuse their official positions to extort money and favors from businesses. Between 2009 and up to the time Solace and Garrido were indicted, years later, during the Calvo administration, Solace and Garrido were known to protect local gambling establishments while using their power to threaten and shut down others. In 2011, the former director of communications, Troy Torres, became aware, aware of Solace and Garrido's activities and reported them to the Revenue and Taxation Deputy Director, Marie, Marie Benito. Benito refused to investigate the matter, telling Torres that some business establishments are complaining over sour grapes because the compliance officers were doing their jobs. Torres continued receiving reports of the misconduct, misconduct over the next two years. Finally, when word of the federal, federal investigators into Salas and Garrido reached Benito, she arranged for an investigation into the compliance office. Torres became irate with Benito in 2014 over the seeming reluctance of Benito to investigate the corruption he had been reporting for nearly four years. Salas and Garrido, along with the Guam Customs officials, eventually were indicted, but not for the string of corruption crimes relating to those bars and gambling establishments, but for the case involving Valencia and Alvendia. Salas, Garrido, Alvendia, Cruz, Pablo, Paulino, Chrysostomo, Constantino, and Frank Cruz's wife, Becky Cruz, were indicted in district court on April 29, 2015, for a host of corruption charges, including conspiracy to defraud and to deprive honest services, wire fraud, extortion, bribery, and the trafficking of counterfeit goods. All these charges are the subsequent convictions involved in the scheme to allow Valencia shipping containers of cigarettes to make it through customs without being confiscated or taxed. The cigarettes involved in this scheme and the Valencias were being used for a larger design. Using his authority over, over the customs sill and his position as the IT supervisor, Customs Lieutenant Henry Alvindia stole confiscated fake bags from the customs evidence locker as though he were not making enough money from the Valencias who had been paying him and the others for a quick inspection of their shipments. He also sold Mr. Valencia the counterfeit bags. The Valencias, for their cooperation with the federal authorities, never were indicted for their part in the scheme, and rightfully so. They were victims in a much larger conspiracy by local enforcement to abuse their power. But it wasn't just the cigarettes and the bags that were no what is left unsaid in the total corruption scheme and how it ended that leaves our investigative team to wonder whether justice was truly done. On the morning of December 16, 2010, Guam Customs Officer Eugene McDonald and Ed Mangalta received their orders from Supervisor Annette Aminzo to head to the parking area south of the Valencia stores. When they got there, custom seal had been broken from the container and in, in its place was a panda. Four witnesses who were employees of the Valencias told the officers that Le Lieutenant Henry Alvarez had been inside the container earlier that day. On the ground was an, un was an open package with packaging material that was discarded. The officers called Avendia, who showed up, unlocked the padlock, and left. A witness to the earlier opening of the container saw Avendia open the container, remove the package, and leave. A series of communications ensued, prompted by Nangalta's outrage at the clear violation of protocol and what he termed as violations of several laws. 
Alvinpia ended up texting another customs officer, Charles McDonald, asking him to inform any official who asked that he was with Alvinpia when Alvinpia opened the container. The inquiry led to a meeting at the office of the acting director of customs, Alvinpia's close friend, Ralph Scambaluri. Nangata stormed out of the meeting after discerning that Scamaluri was more interested in the events of December 16, never leaving his office. He accused Scamaluri and Alvindia of corruption as, as he stormed out. In his April 29, 2011 interview with the FBI Special Agent Gerald Hewitt, Charles McDonald told authorities that it was likely that the contents Alvindia removed from the container was not cigarettes but drugs. Was Alvin Villa using Valencia's container shipments to traffic in narcotics? In several instances throughout Alvin Villa's term as the IT supervisor, the person who controlled the camera system into the evidence locker, documents and narcotics went missing. The evidence locker itself was set ablaze, destroying confiscated contraband, including illegal drugs and even the security camera system. Yet Henry Alvin Villa has not spent one day in jail. He wasn't even terminated from his job. He was allowed to resign, to cash in his unused annual and sick leave, pull his full retirement benefit, and most worse, he maintains the right to be reemployed at customs if he should desire his job back. How did this happen? More importantly, why did the trial stop at Alvin Villa? On July 28, 2015, an amended plea agreement executed between Alvin Villa's attorney, Federal Public Defender John Gorman and the United States Attorney Alicia Lentiaco set Alvindia free in exchange for his assistance to the federal government. One would think that such a system of Alvindia's boss, the person implicated by other customs officers, as the real person behind Alvindia's activities, customs director Ralph Scambaluri. But Alvindia did not give up his boss after the plea agreement was signed and the United States Attorney's Office was caught in a bind. They had just set the most corrupt law enforcement official arrested in the history of the island, hoping to get his boss, but getting nothing in return. These men were responsible for the tra trafficking of drugs to the island. This is the actual supply of the drugs. I was a former drug user and drug dealer many years ago. There are many drug dealers across this island but they wouldn't have any drugs to deal if not for the people at the top in positions of power like Alvin Dia and Scamba Lurie who allegedly supplied the narcotics that made it into our streets. Without Alvin Dia's testimony against Scamba Lurie, he promised the federal government something else. The trafficking of narcotics from California by two people who had nothing to do with customs corruption scandal, Raymond Martinez and Juanita Moser. By all accounts, witness reports and the, evi and the evidence Martinez and Moser had never, had never before been involved in the trafficking of narcotics, let alone its supply from California or anywhere else into Guam. Yet Alvin Dia now has his freedom in exchange for the heads of Martinez and Moser in a scheme he designed with the federal government that has brought the, those two into their second trial district court of Guam. Stay tuned for part two of this three-part series.